Hello, and welcome to this video on a fascinating topic the mysterious map created by none other than the legendary polymath Leonardo da Vinci. Before we delve deeper into the story of da Vinci's map and its connection to the Okanagan Valley, it's essential to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. The Okanagan Valley has been the ancestral home of the Sioux slash Okanagan people for thousands of years, and their deep connection to the land is evident in their rich culture, language, and traditions. In this video, we have the honor of hearing from members of the Sioux First Nation as they shared their knowledge, history, and stories of the land that da Vinci depicted in his map. Through their eyes, we gain a new perspective and appreciation for the beauty and significance of this place and the people who have lived here for generations. So sit back, listen, and enjoy as we learn from the Sioux First Nation and gain a deeper understanding of the cultural and historical significance of the Okanagan Valley. Our language is so complex that one word will mean many things. Take the word for land, Temhula. Temhula, when you break that down, it means the sphere of living things that turn and rotate. The word for mountain is a uh, We go to the mountains. We we enjoy the mountains to get away from the city, to be up on the mountain tops, to hear nothing except silence. The creeks that come into the lake come from the highest mountains where it's clear and it comes down the valley. Water contains life, life for plants, life for humans. To me, is so humble that it'll seek the lowest place on this earth. My people, we are beautiful people. Not because we're beautiful people, it's because our land is beautiful. Our Demhula. My people are still here. Our ceremonies are coming back. Our language is coming back. And so are we. We are beautiful. We are Oknagan. Because our land is beautiful. After watching the stunning video showcasing the natural beauty and cultural richness of the Okanagan Valley and the Sioux people, let's now take a closer look at the remarkable map created by Leonardo da Vinci and its connection to this captivating land. As an exploration geologist with over 20 years of experience, I was astonished to uncover this remarkable artifact that showcases da Vinci's unparalleled skill at the intersection of art and science. In this video, we'll explore the story behind this map, its accuracy and detail, and its intriguing connection to the Okanagan Valley. The map depicts an incredibly accurate geologic localization that aligns with historical events and suggests that da Vinci may have been the true pioneer in creating topographic profiles. 
while the geomorphology depicted may not be entirely accurate, the map remains an incredible testimony and a priceless piece of proof impossible to deny as it is very accurate with the topography, the hydrogeology, etc., and the location of Colonna, named by da Vinci Salono, as well as the relics found and the natural hazard he witnessed, related to the volcanic eruption of anti St. Helens, around 1482. What's even more fascinating is the map's remarkable correlation with present-day maps of the Okanagan Valley, a place of captivating beauty, vibrant culture, and awe-inspiring nature the very place that da Vinci depicted in his map. This correlation suggests that the landscape and topography of the region astonishingly match the map drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. But the story doesn't end there. The map also revealed native oral legends of European explorers and related archaeological studies that might surprise you due to their very close proximity to the Okanagan Valley. The native Indians of the region referred to these mysterious explorers as the Turtle People, and they may very well have been a mercenary group, with da Vinci potentially being among them. The accuracy and detail of the map, including a profile section, make it clear that da Vinci must have been present to create such an incredible artifact. Have you ever heard of the Spanish mound legend? It's a puzzling legend that has persisted in the Similkameen region and Okanagan Valley of British Columbia for centuries. According to the legend, a Spanish expedition marched up the Similkameen, headed north to Kelowna, in the Okanagan Valley, where they wintered, exactly as written by Leonardo da Vinci in his codified letter, which includes a tiny map of Okanagan Valley itself. Although there are no historical records, Spanish or otherwise, to indicate that a Spanish expedition actually did penetrate inland this far north, this legend is supported by some circumstantial evidence that is difficult to explain away. The relics found in the area add an intriguing layer to the legend, including a sword that was made as early as the 15th century, according to Dr. Stan Kopp, Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Langara College, who communicated via email. Other relics may be as early as the 15th century, in the exact time frame of the secret voyages of Leonardo da Vinci's team. In the Gold Trails and Ghost Towns The Lost Spanish Mound video, historian Bill Barley describes and shows the relics found in the area of Okanagan Valley where da Vinci depicted the map. This is the video of Bill Barley back to 80s, on the legend of Spanish Mount. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, our storyteller. And uh, today he's going to be telling us, a, a, I guess, a story out of his childhood, first of all. This is, it's a fascinating story, mostly circumspection, but with a wonderful touch of potential. Yeah, Mike, we go back a number of years, back to 1944. In the, in the summer of 1944, I'm 11 years old. And my Aunt Gay, who was a Barley and married into the Atwood family, travels to Kelowna. We just moved from the Golden City, old yeah, Rosslyn, Rosslyn yeah. into Kelowna. And she came over to visit her brother, Billy Barley. And uh, he was a rancher here. And uh, so we decided to take a trip down into the Sinokameen Valley. I don't know why. She was visiting someone she knew down there. But that's 40-odd years ago, Mike. I can't remember who it was. But I do remember several things about that particular trip. We're traveling by car through, through, through Penticton, up into the Carameas Valley, and we're coming down into a little place called Olala. Somewhere around Olala, either just northeast of Olala or just west of Olala, I'm not sure. And my aunt makes kind of a curious remark. She says, you know, Bill, she said, over there, I think that's where the old Spanish mound used to be. And she points on the north side of the road. And there was some open country on the north side of the road between Carameas Creek Draw mm -hmm. and Olala and right into Carameas. And I looked over there, and I, so I, I, I inquired. I said, what, what about the Spanish mound? And so she told me what she knew about the Spanish mound. And really what it is, Mike, is a, is a legend in that part of the country, that specific part of British Columbia. And this legend has enough circumstan circumstantial evidence that I think it actually probably does exist. Because all this evidence has been found within a few miles of Carameas proper. So this is what we're going to investigate today, the legend of the Spanish Mount. According to Indian lore and according to the evidence that we can piece together, and some of this is, 
is, is big and some of it is legendary and, and, and of course we, uh, there's a certain amount of conjecture and, and speculation mm -hmm. on this. But we know that the Spanish did, did have ships at the mouth of the Columbia in the mid to late 1700s. And according to the, to the Indian lore, that the Spanish actually mounted an expedition there. And this expedition was a complete expedition. They were fully armed. They had coats of mail, which the Indians called metal, metal clothes. Mm -hmm. They probably had muskets. They had blacksmiths with them. They had horses, which was, again, absolutely traumatic for the Indians of the area. To see people riding animals, which they couldn't do, because they only had dogs that were, that were trained to mm -hmm. carry travois and so on, but to actually see them riding animals, dressed in, dressed in metal clothes, with a white face, absolutely traumatic. And so it was logical that they set out from the Columbia for several reasons. One, it is one of the great rivers of the northwest coast. Secondly, that Columbia territory generally is open. It is lightly treed. It makes for easy traveling, especially if you're traveling by horse. So the, the, uh, the Spanish, the column, which may have numbered anywhere from probably 50 or 60 Spanish soldiers, complete with one of their leaders or two of their leaders. And they went inland up the Columbia, past the Great Down. And so they proceed up the Columbia, heading in kind of a kind of an easterly direction with a slightly northward trend. And the great bend on the Columbia, and then they come up the Columbia, and then they, for some reason, they take another river. They go directly north. Whether it was, whether the Indians directed them that way, because undoubtedly, Mike, they showed them gold that they had with them. This is what they were looking for. Stuff like like this. Well, it, sure. Because the the Spanish would probably wear some gold jewelry and gold necklaces. Now, Certainly. would the would the Indian people have had this kind of jewelry at the time? If there was gold there, surely the Indians would have been wearing gold jewelry. No, the Indians were not interested in gold. They were not interested in, in placer mining for gold. But they, they may or may not have known that it existed in the interior of British Columbia. We don't know that for sure. Mm -hmm. But we do know that the Spaniards, for some reason, took that Okanagan River and went up the Okanagan River almost to what is now the Canadian line or the border with Canada. But not quite. And there another river came in from the west. And this the Indians called the Similtamine. And so they branched off onto that river, which looked like, well, it was a choice. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, kind of a Hudson's choice. So they branched off onto that river. And unknowing to them, Mike, they walked right by Rich Bar, which we alluded to in another program at one time. And Rich Bar, of course, was, was a famous placer mining area. But they weren't looking for that. They were looking for cities of gold, not placer diggings of gold. And then they came up past Rich Bar and came over what is now the present Canadian boundary, past an old rock called Speaking Rock, and up through that South Similtamine country, which is inhabited by the Similtamine Indians. Side, our left in the photograph are two mounted horsemen, and they are white because they have brimmed hats. Now, that doesn't mean they're felt hats. It simply means they're white. That's sort of the language of the Indian sure. pictograph is to have a brimmed hat indicating a indicating, white man. Yes, because the old High Plains sign language was this for white men, yeah. brimmed hat. That could be a metal hat, it could be a, could be a Stetson, it could be a felt hat, it could be anything, but that indicates white. And this is, I think, some very interesting circumstantial evidence, visual circumstantial yeah. evidence, that still exists that says, yes, the Indians did see these, and they, they put that down there for other generations to see. And it, the, the Spanish then move up past Carameas, past Old Carameas, past Carameas Center, and up the valley of Carameas Creek, which swings off to kind of the northeast beyond Old Carameas, up through that dry country. And they're heading kind of in a northeasterly direction. And they go up to a little lake, which we call Yellow Lake now. They can't get through there because it's almost vertical. The cliffs are vertical in Yellow Lake. So they turn back. They come back about half a mile, and they discover a little creek. So they follow this creek. There's a little kind of a, a cleft in the hills there. Sort of the road up to Apex Mountain. That's the valley That's right there. That's right, up to Shingle Creek. So they go up They go up this creek, which is Carameas Creek, known as Carameas Creek now, and they go over the top, and down the other side, they hit another creek, which is called Shingle Creek. And they come down Shingle Creek, which is also fairly open country. They can do all this with horses, Mike. Yeah. And they come to a large flat. And there are two lakes. One is Skaha, mm -hmm. and the other is the lake the Indians called Okanagan. Okanagan. And they look... And they look northward, and they, and they examine both sides of this lake. And on the, on, the, on the east side, it looks easier traveling than on the west, because the west, the hills are more precipitous. Mm -hmm. So they go to the east, and they go through up along that east side, and they go through an old canyon, which we called Painted Canyon as kids. Now now is in Wild Horse Canyon. because there Okanagan were wild, Mountain Park. Sure, Okanagan Mo Mountain Park. And there were wild horses in there even when we were kids. And they go through that, and they go over towards past Okanagan Mission and up into the, a great delta, 
And this is now the city of Kelowna, no, Quaston, the Indians called it. They had camps there, and the camps were well back from the lake where it is today, because uh, that was swampy ground at that particular time. And they go up this delta until they find higher ground, and that's near the old barley stretch, actually. And they... People are used to Kelowna, that's not far from where the Orchard Park shopping mall is. Today. That's right, okay. that's right. And what, what happens here, and again, we're theorizing a little bit, uh, what happens here, this is evidently the fall of that year, probably early fall, and mm -hmm. they, they build a large stable, because in 1863, Mike, they found the remains of a large stable, which was about 40 feet by 75 feet, huge, really quite huge, probably would house several dozen horses, and possibly the men as well. And they found the remains of this, and yet the Hudson's Bay Company had no record of a building of that size yeah. in the Kelowna area, nor did the Northwest Company, nor any of the other free trading companies. So that was put there prior to their coming into this country. So we don't know, we have to assume that another group of whites, because this, all this was log work, it would have been fashioned with iron axes, they do know that, the first people who saw this. So we assume that the Spaniards stayed there over the winter. And it may have been an easy winter, it may have been a very difficult winter. But according to the Indians and according to those, those stories that filter back over the centuries, that they, the Spaniards were decimated, either by disease, probably by disease, yeah. I would imagine, or possibly by hostility from the local Indians. I would think disease would be the more logical one of the two. Yeah. Associated with cold, associated right. with poor food, everything. That's right. And okay. finally they realize after this, after this winter, which is a horrendous winter evidently, that they're not going to find the seven cities of Cibola, that El Dorado is not in the Okanagan Valley. Yeah. And so they decide to return, and the numbers are now heavily decimated. We think there were probably 20 or just over 20 Spaniards left, maybe 25. But they, they follow the same route back. So they go back down along the Okanagan Valley on the east side, down again through Wild Horse Canyon, down through the Penticton area, where there's a, at that time, even then, there would be a large Indian camp. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns, talking about the legend of the Spanish Mound. So what evidence do you have that this actually occurred? This is so much speculation. To a degree, Mike, but there is some very compelling evidence. Now, 1950. Family in the Carameas area has lived there for years and years. They've been there for decades. This is the Parsons family, the late, late Doug Parsons and Bert Parsons. And, and they came across some Indian items that had been buried in an old burial at Clawson, which is just south of Carameas, on a rock slide burial, which is marked by, by Sopa Lally sticks. And somebody went in there and excavated this. Parsons family, fortunately, picked up some of the artifacts. And these are some of the artifacts right ahead of you, Mike. Now, this is just amazing. And why it's so important, we do have our, the occasional metal artifacts found in Indian burials, occasional ones, but in this area, these are not tools. The ones you find are tools, either they're knives or they're axes or something like that. These are weapons. And this is iron, and this would be what, a spear not point? A spear point, right? A spear point. Yeah. And this one here, type this of is halberd. That's a type of Spanish weapon as well. And this one, this looks, look, you can see the design work sure. and you can... Oh, yeah. And this would have been... Uh, and there's, there's, no, there's no use for that for the Indians. So I think this came from the original lost Spanish column. That was because, as you say, some of the uh, weaponry was taken... That's right. ...and distributed amongst the That's native right. people. Yeah. And it would have been a precious thing to be buried with well, one sure. of the leaders. Sure, sure. And so this was found in that burial. That's right. Kept as a ceremonial piece, not as a working, not as a working tool. Quite decayed, too, because it was made out of iron. That's right. But and these were not made out of iron. That's right. Those are quite important. Those are wrist, wristbands, actually, made out of copper. And along with these, in the same burial, Mike, we get these. Now, this is very interesting. These are copper, heavy copper plates, which are perforated, so they'd overlap like this. So this is the armor. This is the armor, and there are eight pieces of this. So this covers all the chest. Now, where did the Indians get the idea of armor? Well, I think they got it from the Spaniards. It's the only piece of metal armor found in southern British Columbia. You'll see that they folded in the edges on this, and uh, it's, 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 it's really quite well done by, by a good blacksmith. So really, the whole story that you've put together is uh, how logically could Spanish artifacts get to the Similkameen Valley? Not just that. We have the pictographs, we have the turquoise, we have the weaponry, 
we have the mail, we have the, the old building in Kelowna, the, the remains of the old building discovered there in 1863. We have the ability of the local Indians to, do, to, to, to formulate the letter R and to pronounce it accurately, which other Indians in the area can't. So there's a lot of kind of circumstantial evidence that I think is, is almost overwhelming. According to Da Vinci's letter, it is consistent that they camped over winter in Okanagan Valley as they found this huge house in early 1860s, never known before. After conducting extensive research, revealed in my book one, Da Vinci in America, I've come to the conclusion that the explorers who first visited the Okanagan Valley were not Spanish, but rather part of a mercenary group that Leonardo da Vinci himself was a member of. This is supported by da Vinci's accurate map of the valley and his detailed description of a natural disaster that occurred there. It's fascinating and mind-blowing to think that such a renowned figure in history may have been involved in this little-known but crucial episode of exploration that shapes our world. In conclusion, the mysterious map created by Leonardo da Vinci is an incredibly valuable historical piece that provides compelling evidence of his expedition to the pre-Columbian Americas. It is a unique and priceless artifact that sheds light on a little-known episode of exploration and shapes our understanding of history. This map is just one of 280 pieces of evidence that I have collected over the years, all pointing to da Vinci's involvement in this crucial period of discovery. It is truly a fascinating time in our history, and the map is a remarkable testament to the brilliance of Leonardo da Vinci as an explorer, artist, and scientist.